Um, last talk. Uh, Christina Elmore is going to give a talk. Now, Christina Elmore, uh, at the very first Write the Docs in Portland, gave a lightning talk. At the second Write the Docs in Portland, she gave a full talk. And now she's uh, traipsing about Europe, speaking. So, welcome, Christina. It's a fun way to start. Your slides go blank. See here. So, I want to start by saying thank you. Um, we owe so much to the people who put in the energy to organize this thing, right? So, I'm so grateful to be here, and this is a wonderful event. So, to Eric, to Nick, to Sam, to Maria, to the video team or video guy, I think maybe there's just one of them. Um, thank you so much. I think a round of applause is in order for putting on such an amazing multiple people ask me if the other Write the Docs events are like this good and, um, and the answer is yes so I hope to see you at, at future events. Um, on a personal note I also want to say thank you to the folks for accepting my talk despite what it's like it's kind of a poor title right it's not a great title like I mean we could talk about it's debatable but like I think it's just it's not a good execution of like the English language, like the might and the not are in weird places. It's just, it's not a great title. So thank you for accepting me um, despite that. I don't think it's completely void of communicative value. I think there's something there. Um, but what the reason that it, it captures the essence of a little bit of what I want to talk about is because I want to talk about document purpose um, as this essential foundation for making sure that when we choose to document, we're making the right choice in format. And then we also make sure we're making good documents and that we're understanding the way that we measure them so we know if they're successful or unsuccessful. So this is a foundational talk. It's conceptual. Um, and it stems from a problem um, that I had. And what the reason that I talk about problems often in terms of what things are not, right? So one of the previous talks I gave was about how documentation is essentially and fundamentally different from presentation. So I came to a bunch of documentarians and I said, documentation is killing the art of presentation. And so I'm kind of here to tell now a bunch of documentarians, like, here's some ways to really mess up your documentation, or here's places where you should avoid documenting. I realize that's a bit of a tenuous platform to be on. But the reason that I'm interested in the knots is because I'm interested in edges. I think that it's really helpful, at least for me, and I have found for other people, to be able to understand something's essence by understanding where it butts up against something that's different. And so, inspired by Sonia's talk yesterday, I um, wanted to use visual metaphors to think about edges. And this Mondrian piece came to mind. Um, but then, once I thought about it some more, specifically with Sonia's talk in mind, I realized that it's not actually the best visual metaphor. And this is actually the same artist. I don't know if you're familiar with Mondrian. You probably know the previous painting. This is some of his other work that's not as famous. This is a better visual representation of the way I think of edges. They're gray, they're a little bit blurry, they're still defined, I mean, we can see that there's some edges there, but I don't have the sense that things are perfect boxes, but I do find it really valuable to press up against the edges of things because I think it helps us understand the essence. So, what was my problem? So I work at a university with a small team that handles the web and web applications. We're also a teaching hospital. And I work with a team of support folks, developers, engineers, and we don't have anyone on our staff who is officially a writer. Um, what's good about that is that it means we have a distributed model where everyone is responsible for writing and we have a pretty strong culture of documentation. But I encountered a problem where I realized I was totally unprepared to tackle a documentation problem that I thought was gonna be super easy. So I was approaching a new feature, like a collection of features, really small, a group of people who were gonna use it who were also very small and not very needy. 
which is amazing. They even told us, like, oh, after they've seen the interface, they're like, we don't really need documentation, which was one of the times that I definitely did not trust the user. So I was like, we are still going to document the shit out of this, because someday I am not going to be told that some other user said, oh, no, it's not necessary. So I sat down to try to outline the documentation and think about who to assign it to, and I started to think, okay, there's an analytics piece, and it's going to be really helpful if I can do just a really quick mapping to show like the analytics events that map to the classes. Okay, that's great. Someone could kind of reference that. But then, like, they're also going to need to maybe have like an FAQ because I kind of need to explain this piece about like, well, what happens when this thing works that's an essential piece of the of the analytics. And then I thought, but yeah, but we probably need like a tutorial because there's this piece of the analytics involving the campaign URL that they could go in and change. And it's really simple, but it needs a tutorial because it's a replicatable step and we want them to be able to do their own input. And so it needs to be a tutorial that shows them where they can insert their own piece. And suddenly I was in this position where I felt like I needed to like step back, like put on my like game face, be like, what the hell am I doing? I'm supposed to be good at this. I have been to write the docs for many years. I should, be, should know how to do this. And I felt really confused about the purpose of what I was doing. And when I get confused, and especially when I'm making decisions for a team, I need to be able to fall back on some principles or some lessons that I consider to be outside the specific domain that I'm in. It's the way I work, and I happen to believe it's also the way of making good decisions. If you're too tied up in the specifics of the, of the project or the domain that you're in, you are not likely to make the best decisions. So, I return to the purpose. And what I'm going to share with you is a mixture of a prescription and a diagnostic tool for what I came up with to be able to understand not the goals of documents, but the purpose, because I think what happened to me is that I started to almost feel like something kind of like scope creep, but it was actually like the kind of disloyal cousin of scope creep. And it's, I, I kind of think of it as like purpose betrayal, because what I was doing was mushing together these documents without a clear purpose, and so I was betraying all of the purposes that I had in mind, which meant that I was achieving very little, and probably on the path to make some really bad documentation. So these are the five purposes that I've constructed for myself. Right? I suspect, but do not have any actual testing, other than with a few other humans who've told me that I'm not completely crazy for thinking this way, but I suspect that these may apply to you as well. But keep in mind as I share these, that coming up with a mental model that is different from this but based on this model could be really useful for you. So let's start and go through them, and I want to kind of define them. And I believe very much in not the objective truth of language, but the value of specificity. So all of the words that I've chosen here are very intentional. To reference something, to provide a reference, is to provide a specific piece of information. So here's a few examples. This is an example from Asana, which is, does anyone use Asana? It's like a team productivity tool. I don't actually use it, but I've had some really productive conversations. All right, we've got one person um, with, with users who did. So this is a great example of a reference where it's just a simple list of functions, basically, right, with descriptions of what they do. This happens to be keyboard shortcuts. This is the type of thing where you're going in not to get an overview of what a keyboard shortcut is. You come in with some context so that you already know how to understand this information, and you just to look up a specific value. This is um, HipChat, which is a, a group chat tool as part of the Atlassian suite. And this is an example of API documentation. I'm so grateful for the folks who spoke about, um, about API documentation over the course of this conference because it actually had me thinking a lot and looking at more documentation, um, API documentation. I switched out this slide a few times. I don't put this up here because I think HipChat's API is necessarily the best documentation. I only use it for troubleshooting, so I can't speak to that. But I think in response to some of what Z was saying, and I would be curious, Z, if you're out there to, to know what you think of this, this is a decent way of presenting a reference because 
as opposed to a JSON blob as just your only way of being able to grasp the data. This is a layout that tells you the type, the property, the description, and then another little piece of information, whether it's required or not. But this is not something that gives you the context, again, about what the API really does. It gives you some clues. This is what you would use if you need to come and look something up to confirm, like, is this a required field? Why is this messing up? Am I missing one? Something like that. So that's what references. I think that a lot of our documents, at least a lot of what we produce, are forms of reference. But one of the things I have learned at Write the Docs over the years is that reference is not sufficient. It's like minimum viable documentation, right? Because it doesn't provide a really important thing, which is context. Which brings me to the second purpose, which is to inform. So, establish awareness of facts. Two things I want to say about the language here. Awareness is the most important term in this definition. Because awareness implies that you have a way of understanding a larger picture. And I use facts here not because I want to imply that there's a, only for objective truths. There could be other things that we could debate about whether they qualify as facts. But I use it here because it can be explicitly plural, and the word information is ambiguous about collective noun, all that stuff. So it's not, it's not as clear. So this is really implies the context piece because the awareness means that you have a collection of information and you can understand some of the pieces about how those facts come together. Some examples, another one from Asana. So in Asana, it's a group of, you have to figure out how you want to organize your, your people. And they have the concept of organization. This is actually quite a long page, but I wanted to show that rather than just provide a glossary that says like organization, is the parent of a team, can have multiple team members, right? That could be a way that you might provide a reference for what the concept of organization is. But this is actually informing people about how, the, how organization in a context-specific way fits in in the Asana ecosystem. And they also have a visual way of demonstrating that. This is fundamentally different from creating a reference for this concept. This is informing your audience about them. Now, another example is kind of best practices. And there are many, many examples in this realm of informing. I suspect that for many of us, somewhere in the 80% range is like most of our documents fit into just informing people. They're not reference documents, they provide some context, but they don't go beyond that. This is an example of best practices. I actually took this after seeing the talk yesterday from the, the guys from the Mozilla Developer Network um, as I was just perusing their documentation. Um, this is a good example of not just listing out best practices for performance. It's not a checklist. A checklist is more of a reference that you can go to to just get that specific piece of information, did I do this? It's an elaborative checklist that provides context to tell you more about how performance works overall so that you can make smart decisions about optimizing performance. So the third one is to teach. And this one is a little obvious in some ways, but can be, I think, deceptive. Um, teaching is so fundamentally difficult. And I think um, anyone who's had to write a, a true tutorial can attest to that, or even record a video tutorial. What we've done is we've moved from reference to inform to teach, and they come with increasing complexity of the commitment of purpose, and the commitment to your user, and the commitment to the language that you're using. So let's look at the definition in some examples. So teaching is about providing instructing for increasing knowledge. And the key word here is knowledge. It's not awareness, it's knowledge. And that's one step, if not multiple steps, above awareness. So this is about giving people instruction so that they can then have the knowledge to make even more advanced decisions about how something works um, and about how they're going to implement it for themselves. A few examples here. HipChat, again, the group chat tool, part of the Atlassian suite, they have a quick start guide. So uh, keywords that often mean that you're trying to accomplish teaching are tutorial, quick start, often sandbox areas will come with something that, that is like uh, a tutorial or has a teaching purpose. 
This takes you through, it has multiple sections that are sequenced out, right? And one of the main things that's really important about teaching is that it has a sequence to it because that's the value that whoever's creating the documentation is adding. It's very explicitly set out to be revealed to you in a way that you as the user can increase your knowledge as opposed to just shooting in the dark and trying to piece together the context yourself. This is one that is near and dear to my heart. How many of you know the MailChimp voice and tone guide? Yeah, so if you don't, it is worth checking out. I will mention that um, I believe so strongly in not cluttering up the slides that I have endnotes that I'll provide that have links to these, as well as some notes about some of the talks here today that I think really resonate with what I'm saying or just really helped me think about documentation differently. So I have a link to this. This is a good example of what I think accomplishes teaching without that kind of cue of being step by step. Nothing here provides one, two, three, four, five, but it is very intentionally sequenced. And you'll notice in the interface, there's not even a search function because it's meant to be something that you can progress through based on just the words they've chosen over on the left. Um, or just let them guide you through it following the arrows. It includes examples and it includes reasoning. This right here down in the bottom left is reasoning for why those examples are there. And if you read through this, you will basically be equipped to have like the knowledge to be able to really write something that matches MailChimp's voice and tone. If you need a voice and tone guide or you need to revamp yours, it's not about the style, it's not about the colors, it's about the way they construct the information and I highly recommend it. All right, so we've got these three. And what I want to do is call out, if you are doing these things, then this is what really matters. The stuff on the right is what you have to get right, or else you really are betraying the purpose of your document. If you're referencing something, you have to hit on specificity and it has to be discoverable. Because what we know from the user experience of the reference is that they're trying, it's, it's the, the ultimate task-based thing where they're trying to get to that specific piece of information and then most likely get out. If you're informing, it's all about context. And there have been so many good talks today, I think, that have touched on both how that might work in UI and how we can do things to make sure that we're providing a level of engagement um, in informing so that the prose itself helps keep people interested so that they can retain the information about context. So if you're, if you're trying to achieve an, an inform type thing, then you need to be thinking most about context. If you're trying to teach, then sequence and relationships are the most important thing to convey. So, does this make any sense, or are people's like, uh, I don't know things going off? Okay, because I want to hear that. The, one, of, one of the lovely things about having the last talk is that I get to express that gratitude and reflect on all of the talks that have happened, but it doesn't necessarily facilitate for the conversation that I want to be having as a result of this talk. I will say that the reason I'm not showing documents from my experience is because I don't have them yet. I'm still working out this model. But the idea is that I could go to a document or a chunk of content that I want to convey, and I could say, it's going to do one of those three things. Am, or, am I trying to do something in this bottom half here? And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But the idea is that I could prioritize one purpose, one, not two, not like little commas, not your little ampersand to throw them in there, one purpose. Because, as I have learned from personal weakness, which is prioritizing, believing, having the hubris to believe that I can do all things, I have learned an immense value of making this sort of decision making, almost to the point that I now have this absurd commitment to it because I'm overcompensating. So I have forced myself to do this Mad Lib style thing where I say, what am I trying to, what is the purpose here? It's not the goal, it's not something I have to write out and like the goal is to help users understand the analytics, uh, the changing out the URL for analytics. It's one word or in the case of the awkward be a reference for, it's four words, but you get the point. And what I can do is fill that in and then I can make a cascading set of decisions based on that purpose. It doesn't mean that I can't try to do other things in the document, 
but the point at which those things start to conflict with my primary purpose, done. It gets its own document, I deal with it, I think about it, I talk with colleagues about how to address that. Because if you don't have one purpose, and you can't track how you're achieving it, like I ask myself, what the hell am I doing? Why shouldn't I be able to do this? Especially for someone who's trying to always reference principles uh, and, and have some truth that I can draw on to make sure what I'm, that I'm making good decisions. So I just highlighted here that white arrow is my obsessive commitment to the primary. That's like my reminder to myself. This is actually taken from one of my like sketchbook notebooks where I said, wrote this down for myself and then drew um, an arrow. I didn't do the happy faces, just full transparency, but. Um, okay, so let's talk about these other two. Engage, definition, attract and incite a response. Engage is a really uh, difficult term right now when you throw in social and everyone wants everything to be engaging, right? Like, who doesn't want that? I think, however, if you are saying that your purpose of a document is to engage users, at least what I should say is that if I find myself being like, I want this to be engaging, I'm failing. I'm failing from the beginning. Because engaging can happen in the context of those three other things, but the main purpose is not to attract and incite a response. And I think that might sound a little controversial because of course it is. I want them to respond by using the API or I want them to respond by clicking this other link to find out more. But I want to show some examples to elaborate on what I mean by engagement. It has a role in documentation for sure. I just don't think it's your main purpose. So this is an example from Slides, which is a presentation tool. This is an example of a form of engagement. It's from their help, support, like knowledge base area. And what they do is they give you an opportunity. This is some back-end software that I've seen in other tools. If anyone knows what it is, um, it has like the same uh, favicon that I, I haven't found out what it is, but Form Assembly also uses it. So if anyone knows what it is, um, it, what is it? User voice. Uh, user voice, okay, thank you very much. So it has you enter an idea. So you might be looking at a support article and then you can enter an idea for something related. And then it also asks for engagement with, um, by voting. So these are fine. Engagement is something that doesn't serve the purpose of the document. It serves other purposes and other business needs that you have. Here's where the problem comes in. And I have seen this in our own documents where you ask people to rate the document at the top. Because what you're doing is you're allowing the, that engagement need. You're like, oh, I want people to vote and to star it. I want to know because I'm going to use those metrics to make better decisions. All very well intentioned. But when you let this dictate how the document flows and how users are presented with the information, you're messing up the purpose. Like You're totally betraying the purpose, which is probably to inform or reference. So slides doesn't do that. It happens to put it at the bottom. but. It, those things can slip in. I think it seems very obvious to not put rating the document at the top, but I will tell you, I have been part of a team that has done that. So it, it happens, probably most likely in academia, uh, but um, we have our weaknesses. All right, so this is from Asana. This is actually the same slide that I showed before. I don't know if anyone noticed. I don't know if you can see at the bottom here where the arrow is. So this is their keyboard shortcut. And at the bottom it says, you know, all of them are pretty normal. It's like tab, open details. But at the bottom it says tab plus B. And then the description is what it sounds like. Just like, that's not, that's not good. I think that, um, was it, uh, Beth might have something to say about that. It's like, it's not very clear. Like, what, what's going on here? Does anyone know what happens when you press that? Okay, yeah, Sam, Sam knows. Any guesses? Like, what does that mean? This is what it means. So. It puts, it, puts a bunch of, uh, puts a bunch of tabbies on the screen. So you may or may not be the type of person who is, gets a little bit of delight from that. But I think this is an example of a small way of inserting, you know, the kind of Easter egg thing in that is a form of engagement, right? For many users, what this does is it kind of reaffirms a little bit of the brand's kind of voice, right? Like, we're professional, we're providing you with all these tools, but we also, we don't take ourselves too seriously, and it's just this hidden little piece. But it doesn't dictate the document. It doesn't drive the document. It's just something there. The reference is solidly, right, solidly there that that's what this is for. And it's just one little thing that got added in that I believe serves as a form of engagement through the vehicle of delight. 
let's look at those tabbies again. So then we get to persuade. And I feel passionately about this because I believe that in our context, documentation for software, for web applications, is not the place for persuasion. I think that if you've ever encountered something that feels salesy in a, in a document that should be a reference document or should be something to help you understand an FAQ, and I have, then you've encountered this betrayal of purpose. Um, the definition that I've got is to induce an action or establish a belief. And I think what some of you are probably thinking is that documents can totally do that. And I agree with you, except I think that they happen in aggregate. And it's actually perfect. I didn't get a chance to add in a slide from Z's talk, but he was underscoring the, the same thing that, that Adam, who spoke at the very first Write the Docs conference, was talking about, which is that in aggregate, your awesome documentation is a form of persuasion, right? Especially early on in a product. But if you try to take any individual one of those documents and you say persuasion's gonna lead the way, it's not gonna work. It's a cultural misfit, right? It's people, sniffers for that are gonna go off. And also, that's not the place for documentation. Persuasion happens in other places to help get people in. Um, I think that one of the things about persuasion um, is that storytelling is really the ticket to persuasion. And there are so many other formats in which the human can convey that story that are really gonna give you the benefit of persuasion, and that's, that's not the right fit for documents. So the last piece that I want to talk about, and this is really a kind of next step personally for me, is how this concept of the different purposes helps me understand defining success. Because if I start to look at some of the metrics that, that I might use to look at the success of documents, and a lot of this keys off of what um, our beloved note taker, um, where is our beloved note taker, is she here? No, okay, so sh she gave a lightning talk, oh there she is in the back, hi there. Um, so talked all about metrics, and then Troy's talk was also about uh, metrics and uh, Twitter documentation. So there's different ways that you might measure the success of a reference article versus an, a tutorial. And the concept of time on the page and return versus new visitors, these have different meaning depending on what you're trying to achieve with that page. So time on page is not really relevant for reference. In fact, you could see that the inverse is true. You don't want people to be on the page for a certain amount of time. You want them in and out because that's the purpose of the page. Whereas a tutorial, you want people to be there for enough time to experience the full tutorial, and so you're going to have a different measurement of time on page. Additionally, with return and new visitors, we, we, we have a complicated relationship, I think, in support documentation for whether we value, like, what do we do with return and new visitors? But sometimes there's a perception that return visitors, if they're coming back in mass to pages, it's not a good sign. But depending on the type of, depending on the purpose of that document, you could define success differently. So that just shows how once you establish the purpose of the document, there are all these cascading implications that affect how you define its success and probably how you also define some of the voice and tone for the document in addition to the scope of content. So what I have given myself as a kind of mantra is to avoid purpose betrayal because I'm someone who needs to be able to make sure that I know why I'm making decisions that I'm making and I was lacking that. I knew from a bunch of other Write the Docs talks that when I am doing things like putting inline tips, that I'm avoiding using the word that the, that the engineers have been using, that we've all been using to talk about the functionality. That's like this tactical thing that I know. But what I didn't know was this more foundational piece about why I was even shaping the document or should I even be using a document at all. So, I realized that in a talk called All Roads, or whatever crappy, all roads might not lead to docs, um, that it's a, little, it's a little awkward that I didn't provide like a road image, right? I know someone's disappointed, he's disappointed, right? Like, I, you have that really satisfying like vanishing point um, of, a, of a, it was just right for that sort of visual metaphor, but I, I couldn't go there. Um, I do have this though, which is one of my favorite paintings by David Hockney, it has beautiful edges. When you get up and you see the paint marks, they're, they're just really beautiful. Um, so for those of you who are dissatisfied by the absence of road imagery, here it is. 
Um, my my slides and endnotes are available online. I don't I don't have a fancy website, but they're they're available through that, and I will tweet out that information. I actually I want to end the talk in the same way that I began with with some gratitude because having been lucky enough to be at the first write the docs, I want to say thank you to speakers who've spoken before, the speakers today, because this entire enterprise that I've embarked on that you see here in this talk. Um, would never have happened without having attended that talk, um, that, that event. And um, it just goes to show that I think what's going to happen is that for those of you who are new here, you're going to go back and these sorts of things will start to happen before you've even realized it. I mean, you're already realizing it now, but you're going to have ways of improving, things to take back, nuggets to sit on. They're going to nest for a while, they're not going to be immediate, but in seven months, seven months to the day, I know, I don't know when, but at some point, <laughs> You, but just mark it on your calendar because maybe it'll happen. Uh, let me know. Um, you're going to have an idea that, that is all about improving your documents. And then you're going to come back and you're going to give a talk. And I look forward to that day. So thanks again to everyone. I'm so happy to have been here. There's something happening after which someone else will tell you more details. <laughs> All right, thanks again.